I am not the Lorax, but tonight I will try and speak for the trees. The Lorax is a Dr. Seuss character in a story by the same name, written in 1971. In it, he tries to save trees from being cut by the Wunzler, an environmental villain that seeks to cut down all the trees at the expense of wildlife, clean air, and clean water. Sue spins a tale of corporate greed and the unsustainable use of our resources in the creation of a product. In this case, a Thneed, a classic Sue's name. I love reading this story to my two little boys, but I can't help but wince just a little as someone who had a career building furniture made from trees. And it's not that I'm ashamed of using trees in the creation of something of value and necessity, is that the story seems to suggest the reader must choose between cutting a tree or not, between using a product made from a tree or enjoying the ecosystem services provided by them. And to me, it's not that simple. So I'm no Seuss, but tonight I'm going to tell you my story in hopes of helping you understand how forest products go beyond the cutting of a tree. About 10 years ago, I started a sustainable forestry nonprofit called Root Cause, whose mission is community sustainability through forestry and forest based products. The inspiration was the Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project, also known as ASAP. Now, many of you are familiar with ASAP and their support for local farms and the promotion of locally grown food. Their promotions are masterful, and almost every car in Asheville has this bumper sticker extolling local food that is thousands of miles fresher. So before I got started, I went to ASAP to learn how they became so successful in promoting sustainable agriculture. What well, turns out, ASAP had actually considered promoting local forest products, as most farms also have forests. But before doing so, they decided that market research was necessary to better understand how the public perceives forest products in order to craft the most effective message. So the first question that pollsters asked was, what is a forest product? And the most common answer was, I don't know. Well, this was eye-opening for ASAP, is how do you convince the public the need to support something that they are either unfamiliar with or unsure of what it even is? So ASAP decided to stick with what they did best. And me, well, I left that meeting thinking, certainly I know what a forest product is, and I can figure out a way to convince the public the need to support it. If only it was as simple as coming up with a catchy bumper sticker. I think there are three or four cars in Asheville that have this one. <laughs> now, I've had some success, but it wasn't until I better understood sustainability through a career in wood products that I could effectively communicate the essence of what a forest product is. Let me back up. About 25 years ago, I was fresh out of college, putting my biology degree to good use as a house painter. <laughs> With few career choices, but inspired by time in Wyoming, my good friend Roger and I decided to build a log bed in his parents' backyard. It was made from southern yellow pine, and we had to get a draw knife from a neighbor to hand peel each log. It was big and heavy, but beautiful. We set it up at a flea market, we sold it, we got an order for another one, and thus Appalachian Designs was born. We grew the business out of a storage unit with dreams of becoming the next This End Up or Broy Hill Furniture. For over 20 years, I had the coolest job in the world, designing and building unique, one-of-a-kind custom pieces of furniture and railing systems. I would do trade shows and my customers would run their hands against the log, revealing fantasies of owning a log cabin in a simpler life. There's something about the warmth of wood that plastic or metal could not replicate. And the woods that I was using were unique. They were rhododendron and black locust and other small diameter materials that you didn't find at your average lumber yard. I found that unconventional building materials required an unconventional methods for procuring them. And so over time, I built a supply chain of people who made a living tromping through the woods, carrying out what they could harvest on their shoulders. Not easy work. 
it started to become clear to me of, of the many people whose lives were tied to the forest. And like farmers, these were the people whose work went unnoticed when you marveled at a finished piece of furniture. My customers were often landowners who had purchased multiple acres for a second home and were now forest owners by default. After building their home, the surrounding forest became the backyard they didn't have to mow and was maintenance-free. Now, this landowner group was a growing group of people that made up the non-industrial private woodland owners who own over 60% of the forests in western North Carolina. Now, while our region is fortunate to have over a million acres of state and federal forest, the majority of what you see is privately owned. Forests were now becoming more valuable as a retreat than a repository for timber or pulp. And with it were many landowners who valued hiking and wildlife, but few who understand the, the connection of the loss of forest health and the absence of management. So here was a, a whole other group of people on the opposite end of the socioeconomic scale whose lives were also tied to the forest and whose management decisions were impacting forest resiliency. During this time, the furniture industry was leaving North Carolina for places like China and Vietnam. High Point was losing its status as the furniture capital of the world, and now there was a market in Las Vegas that was closer to western ports and the furniture that was be being imported from the Far East. And with it came shuttered factories in places like Hickory and Morganton, which resulted in a reduced economic vitality for a lot of small towns that were tied to the furniture industry. It was now cheaper to cut wood, send it across the United States, ship it across the ocean, turn it into furniture, and bring it back to the United States. Slowly, the perception of what a chair or dresser should cost was reduced in this new global economy, making it even harder for local companies to compete. Another unforeseen result of this shift was the loss of uh, the economic vehicle that once drove forest management and local production. Now global demand would drive management in the absence of local industry. Then came 2008, the downturn, which crumbled the housing industry and many businesses like mine that were tied to it. Now, one silver lining in the downturn was a forestry grant that funded the start of root calls. I saw that there was a need to support local businesses so they could remain relevant in this changing time while educating the public of how the health of our region and the success of our region is tied to forest health. I began to see the connection between forest management and the economic and social health of our region. It seemed fitting that the birthplace of modern forestry should also serve as the epicenter of using science to improve forest health, while also acknowledging the economic and cultural importance of forests for our region. I became enamored with sustainable forestry, and ultimately sustainability, leading me back to college to pursue a degree, a master's in sustainability studies. I was mesmerized by the complexity of our problems and the need for positive community-based solutions. I learned that sustainability was, just as, was not just an environmental movement, but just as much as it, excuse me. I learned that sustainability was no more an environmental movement than a social or economic movement. Instead, sustainability shows us that you must address all three in unison while assessing their connection. I began to view my many classes through the lens of forestry, and I took notice that forest management was just as systemic as the forests themselves. You see, the most biodiverse forests are often the most resilient, with each species playing a symbiotic role with others. If one species is lost or degraded, then there are changes causing unforeseen consequences reducing the health of a forest and making them more susceptible to pests and climate change. Now, similarly, community resiliency is degraded in the absence of forest management and a forest products industry. 
especially in the more rural counties that relied on healthy managed forests for their economy. Whether it was the landowner who needed the money from a timber harvest to pay for his kid's college, or a third-generation logger trying to feed his family with a chainsaw, they both play a role in a diverse community. Sustainability was about meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the needs of the next. And this was accomplished by, under, by listening to both individuals and communities and understanding how the benefits of economic production and a decent quality of life can be achieved without degrading ecosystems to the point that they are unable to renew themselves. And this is not easy given the many threats to our forests. I feel like I could give an entire talk just on the threats to our forests. A changing climate creates drought-like conditions that are responsible for over 100 wildfires out west this year. And we were only two years removed from the devastating wildfires that destroyed both life and property in our own backyard. Invasive insects are killing our hemlock and ash trees, while non-native plants like multiflora rose and bittersweet outcompete our native plants for sunlight and nutrients. Private forests are not being managed, they're being developed, becoming more fragmented, and even those that are not being developed aren't being managed. About 5% of our non-industrial private woodland owners have management plans. 5%. This means that management decisions are often made last minute, under pressure, which is never a good recipe for decision-making of any kind. And in the absence of management are global pressures by countries seeking to colonize this incredible resource. In eastern North Carolina, whole trees are cut down and turned into wood pellets to help fuel a European clean energy plan. While in the western part of the state, about 80% of our hardwoods are sent to China to help furnish their growing middle class. These conditions were creating a wicked problem that could not be resolved without the support and participation of our largest landowner base. That's why I completed my master's by researching why landowners chose not to manage their forests and what could be done about it. I wish that I could tell you that the results of my research had found the answer to this problem. But like most sustainability issues, there is no magic answer. Instead, there's a nudge for behavior change that points us in the right direction, which must be adaptively managed over time. Now, part of the solution is going to be how we incentivize forest management and incentivizing for values other than timber as a commodity. By encouraging the management that protects watersheds or removes invasive species, both through tax abatements, both communities, counties, and individuals will strengthen their assets. We also need to look how forestry professionals engage with landowners. My research found that landowners that utilize peer networks are more likely to be active managers of their forests. My project monitored a group called Women in the Woods. This was a group of women landowners that were given the space talk about their forest management. I witnessed that when peers get together and share experiences and resources, they are empowered to make proactive management decisions. And lastly, we need an answer to the question, what is a forest product? Our currently accepted economic model defines forest products as the forest material for direct consumption or commercial use. What about non-consumptive products? like clean water or tourism. Now, while trees are not solely responsible for the health of either, no one can dispute that the clean water that fuels our beer economy or leaf season that brings in the tourist every year would be negatively impacted with the loss of forest health. So, if clean water and other ecosystem services were considered forest products, would it make a difference how we manage our forests? Over 150 years ago, Henry David Thoreau 
began to notice the impact humans were having on our natural resources and that our forests were changing due to the impact of man. He was a keen observer of nature and kept meticulous notes, some of which are used for, as a baseline for research done today. One of his journal entries noted, if we attended more to the history of our woodlots, we should manage them more wisely. I think he was on to something. The history of our region's woodlots are checkered with both good and bad management, both of which we need to consider as we try to manage against the changing forest landscape. So tonight, I'm recruiting modern-day Thoreau's to continue his work of observation. To look beyond the trees, to indeed see the forests and all the lives that are impacted by it. In doing so, you might be compelled to buy more local furniture or certified wood and paper products while being mindful of the many lives that are impacted by it. Bearing witness to the impact of man on our forest may also compel you to support one of the many nonprofits in our region that, whose mission is the sustainable stewardship of our forests. These are also keen observers sort of what's going on in our forest, and they are working hard to make sure that any impact of man is sustainable. They're always looking for more throws to join their ranks. And lastly, your observation should include your own forested communities. Pay attention to trees, because they often tell a greater story of what is going on around you. And if you, own a forest, if you own a forest of any size, consider writing a forest management plan that speaks to what you value most about your forest. And try to consider how to keep those values on the landscape. If you're unsure of where to start, talk to your neighbor or your friend and learn about the many forestry resources that are available to you. Ask yourself, what is a forest product? and give thanks that we have this incredible resource available to us. And no matter what your answer, be sure you do your part to assure that those products are available to future generations. I'll leave you with the quote from the Lorax. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you.